Good morning, everyone. And actually, I think good evening, um, Louis. My name is um, Ivo Siegmann and welcome to the Northwest Seminar Series of Mathematical Biology and Data Science. This seminar series is co-organized by the University of Liverpool, the University of Manchester and Liverpool John Moores University. Today, the seminar is hosted by Liverpool John Moores University and will be presented by Professor Louis Stone from the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Melbourne and actually also Tel Aviv University in Tel Aviv in Israel. We are very close to the end of our seminar series for this semester. So after Louis talk today, we will have Ginestra Bianconi next Monday on uh, 17th of May at 2 p.m. And then our last talk for a while will be delivered by Veronika Greeneisen from Cardiff University on Wednesday, the 26th of May at 1 p.m. So um, let me introduce um, Louis Stone to you. Louis did his undergraduate and PhD at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. And um, then he did postdocs at the University of Melbourne and the Weizmann Institute um, in Israel. I think then you stayed in Tel Aviv at Tel Aviv University for a really long time, for um, more than 20 years, I think. Yeah. And yeah. Um, a few years ago, I think, um, actually, I realized that it's not um, that, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, it's actually already a few years as well. <laughs> you moved back to Melbourne. And now you're a professor um, of mathematics at RMIT. Um, in Melbourne, I actually did meet Louis uh, when um, I worked there as a postdoc a few years ago. And I remember that we had a few really nice coffee chats. And um, I think we also talked a lot about mutualism. So I'm really excited to hear what um, happened since, I think, 2015, um, since we last talked about this. So I look forward to your talk, Louis, on um, random matrices biological networks and the stability of complex systems. So that was the uh, complicated title, or when Google meets, uh, when Google meets Lotka Volterra. Uh, uh, over to you, Louis. Thanks very much, Ivo. Actually, uh, yeah, my family's um, my, actually from Manchester, so uh, got the full circle here. Um, so yes, this talk uh, puts together a few different things that um, I've been playing around with over, um, over some years till COVID came along and I had to put it away, but I thought this is a, a good time to get it out again. Um, so let me begin with um, the Gardner and Ashby in 1970. They did this amazing study on um, large complex systems. And I really love their introduction. They say many systems being studied today are dynamic, large and complex. Traffic at an airport with 100 planes, slum areas with 10 to the four people, the human brain with 10 to the 10 neurons. In such, in such systems, stability is of central importance. Unfortunately, present theoretical knowledge of stability in large systems is, is meager. And that was in 1970. And their graph on the right of connectance versus stability is uh, really what um, I think uh, it's coming on to 50 years later where we're still talking about similar things. Um, just the numbers go up by an order of magnitude, I guess, for all of these different things. But uh, So uh, firstly, when we talk about um, large systems, we try and reduce describing them down into uh, adjacency matrices often if we're looking at, um, if we have an n species system of um, a community of n species and we might want to put it into an interaction matrix, we let um, AIJ be one if species J is interacting with species I and we can build up um, a binary matrix, um, n by n binary matrix that will tell us where the interactions are. Now the connections, it's the number of um, links uh, in this binary matrix. So um, apart from the diagonal. So here we see a fully connected matrix, its connectance is one. Here we see a matrix which is 60% um, connected. And so bear that in mind, when we speak about connectance, that's what we're talking about. Now, a few years later, still almost 50 years ago, May uh, came along and wrote this uh, uh, milestone article, will a large complex system be stable? 
And without going into details, he found um, a very counterintuitive result. That is, the, the more connected a system was, um, the more, the more it could be pushed to the brink of instability. And when a, when a system reached a, a critical level of connectance, so it would become unstable. So this phase transition between stability and instability as connectance increased. And um, counterintuitive, because if you imagine a large complex system, you'd think that if the more, the more connected it was, the less it would go unnoticed if you took one link out. So, um, but apparently the more connected it is, the more fragile it is, according to May's theorem. So he, he threw away many established ideas of um, connectedness and stability. So we'll have a look at this a little bit. The, the, the background idea on May's work, and uh, probably quite a few of know it, so just bear with me, please. Um, let's take a, an N species community. Each species has a population NI. And we'll write it as a vector n, and we can write it as um, kind of a, uh, a dynamical system. The NDT is some function of this vector n, nonlinear. And we want to find something about its stability. So let's suppose it has an equilibrium. Can you see my pointer here? Yes, you see yes, it when we I can point? see it. Huh? Yes, we can see it. Ah, great, great. So let's suppose it has some equal fixed equilibrium. And we perturb the system around equilibrium. So we make these little small perturbations and we, we linearize the system about equilibrium. And uh, so then the stability of the system, we can write it in terms of the perturbations, the dynamics of the perturbations. And A would be the Jacobian of this um, nonlinear system. And we will call that the, as you know, the uh, the system would be, or the equilibrium of the system would be locally stable if all eigenvalues of A have uh, negative real parts. So, um, so it boils down, stability boils down to looking at eigenvalues of these matrices or various matrices, depending on their structures. So if we look at just a random matrix where every, every element in this matrix B has, um, mean zero and variance sigma squared. Um, and we plot the eigenvalues. So the uh, extraordinary thing is that these eigenvalues fall in a, um, a circle um, uniformly. And the radius of that circle can be uh, related to this, um, this uh, index here, root n c sigma. And uh, Sorry, where this is not turning pages easily. So here's a complex plane. Here are the eigenvalues of this matrix under such a construction where all n, n squared elements have uh, this distribution. And it just um, falls beautifully in this circle in the complex plane. The radius, um, the size of the radius varies. And of course, it's going to vary with connectedness. So if we, um, if we shift, uh, if we put a minus one on the diagonals here, we have it almost in the form of what May was looking at. We have a strong um, uh, self interactions are very strong and negative, and the other terms um, the other terms are zero. So, so of course we're just going to shift. We're just adding. We're just adding a, a diagonal uh, minus ones on the diagonal, and it's just going to shift the eigenvalue. So instead of being at centered at zero, it's going to be centered at minus uh, one zero. And then, if uh, so, the stability of this system on the top here uh, will depend on whether these eigenvalues um, can reach into the right hand uh, plane. So if they cross the y axis. So of course that will be when gamma is large enough. So it becomes unstable when these eigenvalues cross into the right hand and unstable when gamma is greater than one. And of course we, uh, we know by theoretic, theoretical calculations say gamma is root nc sigma. 
So you can see that as, as C becomes large or as sigma becomes large or N becomes large, we're going to, uh, the eigenvalues are going to have positive real parts and the equilibrium will become unstable. So um, this, this uh, whole concept works quite nicely. So if we look, if we build an ensemble of these uh, uh, systems um, and count, count for a fixed gamma, count how many of them are stable, we'll see that uh, at the small gamma, they're all, um, they're all stable. But when gamma becomes close to one, um, gamma being root nc sigma, uh, they start becoming unstable. And the sharpness of the, uh, this phase transition becomes sharper as n becomes larger as, as you would expect. <laughs> so uh, counterintuitive because the more connected a web, the larger is gamma and the more unlikely it's going to um, uh, survive a perturbation. So uh, what about looking at more different structures? And I've, I've, just before I get to that, I've got a note here about the tropics because the tropics are the, the most connected systems in the world. So um, um, they're very rich and diverse. So we have, it's a warning that maybe they're the most uh, um, fragile systems that we have. So, um, Okay, that was the May uh, setup. And um, I wanted to extend this to look at lotka Volterra competition models, starting with competition and, and then moving on to mutualism, as Arvo said. So let's consider an N species competition model. And uh, the lotka Volterra equations are given in this form. And I think uh, I'm, I'm presuming that most of you have seen these equations. So Ni is the biomass or the number of individuals of species I. Uh, the one is considered like the birth rate, the Aij is the interaction terms. And um, um, Ri is the, um, the growth rate of the different species, which uh, we're not concerned too much with at this point. The point, what we are concerned with is let, let the interactions be of this form so that there's a um, species I and J, species J competes with species I with mean strength C and a fluctuation around that mean strength of Brj sigma squared. So it's the previous setup, but now the, um, instead of being zero mean, we've got a mean of minus C. So uh, we're going to let, every species suffer from the presence of every other on the average, okay? There may be some that uh, we can exclude uh, some that, or, or control the distribution. I can give this a uniform distribution to ensure that no interaction becomes positive. Uh, but actually it doesn't change the results all that uh, much. So now we find that the key parameter is going to be this gamma that's scaled by one minus C. So the same gamma, over one minus little c, where this little c is the strength of competition. And uh, the first thing, uh, rather than jump, jump on this straight away and look at uh, stability, let's look at the equilibrium itself. So when is this system feasible? When do all species have positive equilibria? So uh, with a little bit of uh, messing around with the equations, you can show that the ice species has a population at equilibrium given by some common constant, one minus the sum of the perturbations of speak. Th these are the, uh, these terms scaled, the dash means scaled by one minus C. And um, of course there's, an, there's approximations there of eliminated second order terms. Um, Okay, so and we find this by looking for equilibrium conditions. So from this point, uh, one could even calculate a probability that a, a species I has a positive equilibrium, and we'll call that P of gamma. And then the pro pro uh, probability of feasibility uh, to a first approximation is this probability that one species is positive raised to the power of n. 
And one can write out the probability distributions. It's a very simple system to work out what is the um, probability that one species is uh, positive, and it will be given in terms of the error function. It's, it's normally distributed, and one can go and do that. And one can calculate P of gamma, this probability that one species is, has a positive equilibrium. And if we plot that probability um, as a function of gamma, you get this purple line. So to get, to look at the probability that um, a community of eight species is feasible, we look at P of gamma to the N, we get this green line and a hundred species and we get this uh, red line, sorry, blue line. And so what I've done here is plotted simulations, the, uh, the symbols of the simulations for a system for a uh, lock of Altera competition system and its feasibility versus the theoretical predictions based on these uh, simple uh, probability principles. And based on the approximation that you can just raise, it's the probability that all n species, basically that the species are independent uh, um, or the probability of feasibility is independent anyhow. So, um, but they match up really nicely. So the, um, but what we, what we see, I mean, the, the point of doing this is we see what values of gamma allow for feasibility. And we find that for larger and larger systems, gamma shrinks uh, considerably. We find that you have to have gamma much less than one to get a feasible community. So if we compare the, the curves for uh, stability, which I showed you before, local stability, where the, the May threshold was gamma equals one, we find that the feasibility criterion is much more stringent. And so uh, one wonders, is the question that you should be looking at, is a large system stable? Is that the right question? Or should we be looking at what makes a system feasible? So when is a large system even feasible? Um, okay, so let's um, let's come back to the uh, stability now. Uh, someone wants to ask a question there, but I'm not sure how to um, deal with this. Ivo? Um, yeah, if you are ready to take the question, then um, Tobias Gala, would you like to ask your question? Um, I think you are unmuted, but we can't hear you. At least I can't. Yeah, neither can I. Uh, oh, now? Can you now hear Yeah, me? now we can hear you. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, well, if you allow the question, I can ask it later if you prefer, as you, as you prefer. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Go, so I think your notion of feasibility is that all of these species survive, right? I mean, you, you have N, I don't know, let's say a, a certain number, capital N of species in here, and your notion of feasibility, if I got this right, means that they all have to survive, right? Is, is that uh, technically, they all have a positive equilibrium. All right. So you start these local Volterra dynamics and you, you, you're asking under what circumstances is the fixed point such that all NI are positive, right? Yeah. But, but that is not the only way to generate a large system. You can, if you start with a thousand species and half of them survive, you still have 500, right? That's still yeah. a large system. So, or if you start with N and N over two survive in the in limit of large N, that's still a large number. So I, why this focus on all of these species surviving? I guess that's my question, I guess. Um, I mean, you could say well, there was a pool. There, there are various ways to look at this problem. Yeah, you're 100% you're correct. And the answer is that what you're proposing is a much harder problem. And that is what will a community collapse to if you start with a a million species, uh, can it exist? Uh, can they survive or can they continue to survive or will they collapse to some subset? That's a whole other problem. Um, could be, uh, it, it's, it's a very difficult problem and uh, why not start, start this way? Okay, I, I, I'll say, okay, I'll stop now. We have written papers on this, this can be done. I'll, I'll, send you a, I'll send you a paper with methods from statistical mechanics, this, this problem can be solved. Yeah, I'll, I know I'll send you a paper. paper. Thanks, guys. Uh, okay, so um, 
So uh, a lot of people go ahead, um, uh, look at these, uh, these large complex systems, look at the interaction matrix, look at the eigenvalues of uh, the interaction matrix and check if it's stable or not. And um, when in fact, uh, there's a problem there because we, the Jacobian of this system is really the, to look at stability, one has to look at the matrix S equals DA, where D is the, uh, um, um, the diagonal matrix with all the population equilibria on it. Very few people do that. So there's been a lot of work on random matrices, Alicina and um, really and many, many papers, but very um, on, only since, uh, I hardly know any since last year, where people have been looking at looking at the stability where of the, the true stability matrix of the system. So, um, so I'm wondering how does one assess this, um, the stability matrix of N species that are persisting currently to bias? So we, we assume that they're persisting now. Uh, will they continue or not? It will depend on this matrix S. So uh, if we look at the lotka Volterra competition uh, model, um, we come back to adding, um, rearranging it. So we get the we get the matrix of perturbations with a diagonal term, which is like the May system that I was talking about. And with competition, it's more or less like adding this what's called a low rank perturbation to it. And I want to check what happens when we do that. And you see something something very interesting. Um, you find that uh, if we take the original system with the competition matrix and then remove it, that, the, that uh, S with and S dagger without the competition, the low rank perturbation, they have the same matrices, all N, uh, all N matrices except for two, sorry, all N eigenvalues except for two are exactly, exactly the same. And this is including the, um, population uh, diagonal that I was talking about, which is never looked at. So you, you get quite a complex problem, but it interest, very interestingly, it was for me when I first saw it, you can just take away that competition matrix and uh, you get all eigenvalues are shared except for two. And the ones that are not shared, um, they're usually, uh, there's something special about them or it's a spectral radius or whatever. So, uh, I, I noticed this maybe 30 or hold on, decades ago anyhow, and I didn't think twice about it, but then um, uh, as I was about to publish something on it, I realized this, this is just the same structure of the Google matrix of the late eighties. And, and since then there's a lot, a lot now known about these uh, low rank perturbations. So it's become quite common knowledge even, but uh, you have this property with the Google matrix that it shares all, uh, uh, except for one eigenvalue, it shares all other eigenvalues. So when I add on this uh, low rank perturbation matrix to the Google matrix, it's, uh, and that's the transportation equation in the Google matrix, they have had this problem that uh, um, they had to allow, I think for links that, uh, um, that wouldn't normally be made. And so they added this low rank perturbation on, on it. And of course, being the Google matrix after, after uh, I think Brin and Page published it in 1998, I've never seen so many scientists try and study the stability of this matrix. All of a sudden, there was a huge phase transition in studying eigenvalues of this matrix, I can tell you. So, um, uh, so I liken it, the property to, to this, and we can say that uh, can actually, um, you can work out uh, the details and you can work out that um, for, for the purposes of uh, our analyses, we can drop the uh, low rank perturbation matrix and we'll get essentially the same results that if we scale um, gamma, at root n sigma one minus c, we're going to get exactly the same eigenvalue distributions and phase transitions as you would 
with uh, under May's theorem. So stability will be uh, the same criterion except with an adjusted gamma. Um, but what we were finding was that all, uh, all feasible systems are stable. And the reason was because as we showed before, the, 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 the um, restriction on gamma has to be uh, gamma is less than one uh, for it to be uh, feasible. Whereas the restriction on stability is uh, this phase transition at gamma equals one. And the same, the same was true for competition systems. Um, okay, so the, uh, the next thing to do was, uh, can, I, can we say more about the eigenvalues than rather just saying that it's a, a Google matrix? So uh, let, let's, let's look at this. Uh, suppose, suppose we have um, a random matrix. We know that the, the Wigner stability theorem says all eigenvalues are going to be distributed uniformly in a circle. What happens to them when I look at the true stability matrix S equals DA? Namely, I multiply by a diagonal of population equilibrium values, um, this thing here, D equals diag, times the interaction matrix. What's the, uh, if, if this is the um, eigenvalues of the interaction matrix, what am I going to get as the eigenvalues of S? So uh, this, is, uh, this is where I introduce Eric Clapton. The eigenvalues come, we have the May Wigner theorem. So these are the uh, Eric Clapton uh, eigenvalues. We have the eigenvalues distributed in this uh, guitar shape. And um, it's quite a nice equation for a guitar, if you ask me. And um, of course, it makes perfect sense because uh, if we if we make the perturbations really small, then um, A, remember A is the effects of the perturbations in A, A will be like a diagonal matrix, uh, the uh, identity matrix. When the perturbations are very small, A will be like the identity matrix. And it's obvious that the eigenvalues are going to be the, between the minimum and the maximum uh, population. They'll just sit there and be real. Okay, but as, as we increase gamma, um, as we increase gamma, we get um, pushed away from this, uh, this real line and we start moving into the imag imaginary axis and we get a more complex thing, but still the, uh, the boundaries of the eigenvalues sit between n min and n max. Uh, so whichever way you look at it, they're, they're falling between n min and n max. And this system here is only true when the, it's when all uh, diagonal terms are the same. In other words, all species have the same population. So the big question then still is, how does, how does May's law, I mean, May worked at, had this whole big theory worked out that gamma has to be less than one, but he didn't look at the Jacobian matrix. He was only looking at, um, yeah, at the uh, this simple case where all uh, diagonal terms are the same. So uh, what can we say about stability? Uh, under what conditions will these eigenvalues move into the, uh, become, have a real part that's positive, okay? So move into the right-hand plane. And that we don't know. Maze, of course, a big gamma is obviously going to push into the right-hand plane. But, uh, oh, this is strange, yeah. So uh, it turned out some, people have been working on this uh, quite a bit, um, but, didn't get very far until uh, this paper in 2015, which wasn't about May's thing, about May's thing, it was, they were dealing with neurodynamics mainly, but there, there's a way to get the envelope 
of um, this, these red points, how do you get the envelope of the eigenvalue distribution? And these guys came up with a, um, I found it quite by accident, well, not by accident, I was looking like crazy for um, a way to get this envelope or some, tell me something about this stability of this matrix uh, S. And um, I, con I converted their, their um, analysis to the case of May's, of the May matrix. And I found one could work out the, um, the um, perimeter here of the eigenvalue distribution. And it would be governed by this equation here that if you, if you know the equilibrium number, um, it would be whenever if you took this sum over all the uh, over all n species, and you let z and z bar be a point in the complex plane, you look for all points in the complex plane. You work this this sum out for all points in the complex plane, and you ask yourself whether it's greater or less than one on sigma c squared. And if it's greater, you put a blue dot. Okay. And it works like that. And, and that way you can get the boundary of the eigenvalue distribution. So we have a formula here for giving us the boundary points. And so um, what one can do uh, is look um, is to see if it works well, first of all. So here are some, uh, some simulations where uh, for different values of gamma, I plotted this, um, uh, the points that satisfied this inequality. And so for gamma equals 0.9, it's this, uh, these black points, okay? And this is the boundary given by this equation. And you find that all the eigenvalues lie within that boundary. And for gamma equals 0.2, the yellow, yellow dots are the eigenvalues and the red is the boundary calculated by this equation. So it seemed to give really good results. Um, and what I wanted to know was what's the condition when this, when this red line moves into the positive right-hand plane because then you'll get instability. And I was um, you know, hoping to find something that's uh, going to eclipse the May result. So what did I find? If you uh, so, what we have to do is take this equation and put in the points where z equals zero into it. Okay, so we let z and z bar equal zero, and we look when does this red uh, perimeter cross the y-axis? So we're putting in zero here. Uh, everything simplifies. The ni star squared cancel. And we find the point the the value of gamma when the red line crosses the axis is when gamma squared equals one. So we retrieve the May result. That is that inst uh, instability arises exactly when um, May predicted it. Even in this case where we're, we're including a, a population equilibria, which, uh, which is pretty neat, I thought. And the other thing is uh, you can show that the uh, eigenvalues for low perturbations, it makes sense that the eigenvalues approximate the population values, but more on that. Um, okay, sorry about this. Um, okay, so we now move, uh, so that, that's kind of part one where um, I attempted to find, I was hoping to find something uh, that would um, give me new criteria for looking at, the, at these more, the true condition for stability in these uh, Locke Volterra models. And, and in fact, any model where S equals DA and um, only um, rediscovered the wheel kind of thing. It went back to May's results. So that was a bit disappointing, but, uh, but, um, but pretty interesting anyhow. So um, let's move to, we looked at competition and uh, let's move to mutualistic systems. 
which uh, have always been considered inherently unstable because uh, uh, even Robert May would be talking about them as populations proliferating in an orgy of uh, mutual benefaction leading to exponentially growing populations. Uh, even recently in, in the last few years, there's been several articles saying mutualistic interactions are destabilizing, increasing the proportion of cooperative interactions nearly always decreases the overall return rate and the likelihood of stability. So uh, on the other hand, you know, there, are, there were these, uh, historically, these people who big believers in mutualism and uh, mutual aid and cooperation, stemming back to the, the famous Prince Kropotkin of Russia, who actually uh, had his hand in modeling and uh, Oh, he had an offsider. I can't remember his name now. A uh, famous mathematical modeler in the Russian school with, with Kropotkin um, before the Gelfand group, even. Um, but he was known as the Prince or the Anarchist Prince. And he wrote books on, he, he observed animals and wrote books on mutualism as, uh, and I believe did some models. And then we come to these random matrices approaches, which are looked uh, being used quite a bit um, uh, now to look at the human microbiome and to look at bacterial interactions. And they all say the same thing, cooperative interactions uh, destabilize and competitive interactions stabilize. So typically, you'd find that as, as the uh, proportion of uh, co cooperation increases, you find that the eigenvalues, as it becomes more red, the eigenvalue distribution moves into the right-hand plane, looking at these mutualistic models. Or as, uh, as the proportion of mutualists increase, you get, um, you go from 100% stable to uh, zero percent stable. And you actually see uh, graphs as, as you increase the proportion of uh, mutualism, the eigenvalues distributions, uh, the red dot starts moving into the right-hand plane. And uh, commonly these, these studies, they look for the largest uh, eigenvalue um, or the, the least negative, uh, and see how that behaves as the proportion of mutualism increases. And either it becomes more stable, uh, more stable, what they really mean is more resilient because uh, as, long as, as long as your eigenvalues are negative, you're stable. So, but the closer you, the, um, the, largest the largest negative eigenvalue, the closest it gets to zero, then the, uh, the longer the argument is the more resilient it is, and the longer it, you know, if you give the system a perturbation, it's going to take a long time to return to equilibrium if that uh, dominant, the largest eigenvalue is very close to zero. So uh, I set up the simple uh, model that I showed you before, the Lotke Valtura model for competition, but I just changed every competitive term into a mutualistic term. Uh, and I did variations on that, you know, I looked at, um, um, random interactions and so on. So not every, not every interaction was, um, let's say, let's say allowed for uh, zero interactions as well. Uh, so here's, here's an interesting plot. With, uh, with no mutualism, I plotted the time taken for the system to return to equilibrium. Oh, I didn't plot the time, I watched the time. So as when there's no mutualism or mutualism was switched to zero, it would, um, it would uh, take its time to get to, uh, for the perturbation to die out, because this is the perturbation, okay? So we start the per perturbation of point one, and for, you see four different runs over time, and it's taking its time to die out. Whereas when I switch the mutualism on, 
let the species interact uh, and cooperate, it rapidly, uh, the perturbation rapidly died out. So this, I was um, quite amazed with this and I wanted to explain why this is happening. And um, so I did what the others were doing. I'd plot the eigenvalue um, as a function of cooperation. And I'd always find that the, the, uh, the most, the least negative or most, uh, or the largest eigenvalue oops, would, uh, as, as cooperation increased, it would become more and more negative. So, um, that's strange, I thought, and this was with 100 species and uh, species were allowed to inter interact mutualistically, connectance of 0.7. I did many, many different experiments like this till I understood a bit more what was going on. And what, what, I've, what you find is that the, uh, the um, if you plot, these, these are for plots for different levels of mutualism and these plot the eigenvalue distributions. And as the um, levels of mutualism goes up, this, these red dots, which are the eigenvalue distribution, it's the, um, they shift, they shift to the left and become more and more negative. But the, this, we still have one, always have this eigenvalue at minus one because the, uh, the S matrix, which I didn't tell you, I didn't go into details, but remember I told you that some eigenvalues don't change. So this is one of them. We always have this equation that S, the Jacobian, the true Jacobian times N star is minus N star. So we always keep this uh, eigenvalue minus one is staying. But all the others just shift as, as I increase cooperation, the whole matrix, the whole um, distribution moves le further and further leftwards. So um, that's really uh, interesting. It means to me um, that it's kind of uh, becoming more and more stable, obviously, they're becoming more and more negative. And the blue dot gives it all away. The blue dot is the average population equilibrium. And we see that uh, the eigenvalues are spread around the, uh, the mean of the equilibrium populations. And you can prove that. You can prove that the mean of the eigenvalue distribution will be the mean, um, the mean value of n, n star. Here we go, this. So as, as this as you increase the proportion of uh, mutualism, the actually the population equilibrium levels grow up because everyone's trying to help everyone. They're boosting their equilibrium. And then the eigenvalues uh, shift to the left because they're, um, they control the, uh, the populations control the eigenvalues. In this matrix S, which equals DA, populations times interactions. So it all adds up and uh, we can explain a little bit what's happening um, because if you think about it, um, this what's happening is that when the, uh, how are we going for time? Yeah, good. As, as the eigenvalues are extremely negative, so we have where all the eigenvalues are sitting around minus eight and we've got the this one here, which this one here is telling all the, the usual people saying, oh, resilience, you have to look at the, um, the largest eigenvalue because that will tell you the return time. It's really these guys that are governing the return time in the end. This guy's here all the time. It doesn't even change, actually. The more I change mutualism, it rarely changes. And uh, so but these guys get pushed to the left and they're very strong. Um, so what happens in the phase plane kind of thing is that you find uh, in one direction, in most, in n minus one directions, you're rushing down, rushing, whoops, you're rushing down this line really fast because these are all, you know, got very large negative eigenvalues. And then you slow down because of this guy 
and you move on to this eigenvector n star and you slowly move to equilibrium. So what's happening is we get this huge rush until we're almost at equilibrium and then it just slow, relaxes and slows down a bit and gets to equilibrium. But in terms of return time, you could say that this, this, these mutualists are really helping the system get back to equilibrium and, and then it's, it converges. Uh, it never obviously never reaches equilibrium, right? So you could wait till infinity for it to reach equilibrium. Uh, so that's not the best criterion. Uh, so that's uh, really what I wanted to say today. So thanks very much for uh, listening to that. Uh, thanks a lot for, for this really nice talk. Um, are there any questions? So you can either ask questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself and um, raise your hand, um, use all the tools that you have. May I ask a question? <laughs> so I um, always wonder when I look at um, these studies, um, so when you look at stability, you basically find out that um, you don't um, approach an equilibrium if um, you have instability. But um, if you look at oscillations, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, the system is um, automatically in danger. Um, if you have um, a stable limit cycle that um, doesn't really get very close to um, low population numbers, I wouldn't really think that um, the ecosystem is um, yeah, really in danger of losing quite a lot of species. So is there a way to say something about um, the behavior of the limit cycles as well that you get when you have instability, but um, not extinction of um, a species? Yeah. Um, good question, but it has you have to pose these questions carefully. So that's why we take a kind of a sterile, simple uh, scenario, which we can really pin down and define. We look at all N species and their equilibria and try and understand that. When you start talking about limit cycles, well, I never saw, I mean, you could probably prove that these competition systems that I showed never, uh, don't have a limit cycle, though there are, I mean, you can get even chaos in competition systems. But the point is that, I don't know, I've never seen a periodic system in nature, I totally periodic system cycling either. So it depends, it depends how you're going to pose the question, really. Um, uh, so if, if we restrict our, the best way would be restrict our attention to systems that do cycle, and try and find the conditions where they uh, stability of those system of those cycles are maintained or not. And my guess is it would probably be similar. Yeah. In in trying to answer your question. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I think um, that that sounds um, convincing. So, um, I I just think um, yeah, one possibility might also be to um, see how the system behaves under noise. I guess so when you add. Um, fluctuations, um, how uh, much extinction you actually observe. Um, so um, that would in a way address the uh, problem that uh, you don't really see um, true periodicity in nature as well. Right, I mean, yeah, it's another dimension to add. Um, um, okay, it, it's gonna be very hard to address everything yeah, <laughs> uh, with the one model, but uh, but that like people are doing that, and of course it's it's really important uh, uh, thing to be following up. I agree. Yeah, yeah. So, are there um, any more questions? Tobias has raised his hand. Well, well if I may, but it's, it's the, it, so this is a more basic question, really. Um, um, I so. You said that May's initial findings are somehow counterintuitive, right? That more connectants or more species make this unstable. And I'm not sort of, I understand that this is contradict or contradicts empirical findings in ecology, that there are large systems that seem to be stable. But 
I was never able to understand whether mathematically I should say this is intuitive or counterintuitive. Um, I don't know whether you have any any insight. You said something along the lines of, well, if there are many links and I, if I knock one out, then that shouldn't matter, right? But that's not really what is studied here because one is studying sort of linear stability of a, of, of a dynamical system without changing the interaction. So, I, but I, I've never been able to, to get an under, some, some kind of intuition why this is intuitive or, or not. I don't know. Uh, I guess it boils down to whether the um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know either. I mean, uh, so I, I, I don't know. Why. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, how intuitive is the circular law actually of, of the eigenvalues? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> but but oh, I guess when when I said that, I, I guess I was reflecting what. Uh, what was being said in theoretical biology and, uh, you know, just a simple minded view of a, of a complex system like the tropics where everything's in connected with everything else and it's been known to be stable for many, many years. So the argument was, um, yeah, I wouldn't notice if a link was removed. But there is, it's, it, it comes down to whether the giant component, I guess, is uh, intuitive or not. Uh, in a in a in a graph, it comes down to that uh, uh, percolation threshold. Does this yeah. answer your question, Tobias? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm, yes, yes, yes. Thanks, thanks. So I mean, I okay. mean, we could talk for hours about this. But, <laughs> yes, thanks. <laughs> so we have another question uh, from the chat. Um, I will read the question from the chat. Sure. Um, so the question is a bit lengthy, so I hope I am doing well, so I'll try my best. So the question is about um, something you mentioned as well about microbiomes. So the question is related to a disease related microbiome. So the assumption is that you have um, a higher rate of change compared to a healthy microbiome. So the difference is that in disease, um, the rate of change increases. And the question um, uh, Spirit John McGremis is asking is, can this drift be controlled by managing the microbiome? Um, so um, is there a way to, as I, if I understand the question correctly, to um, basically bring back the disease system to a healthy state? Yeah, I think uh, I'm out of my depth there. We, uh, I'm not... I, I can't really tell you, um, but uh, but I think there in early days with the models of uh, the microbiome, that was my assessment when I saw what they were doing with the um, cooperation and mutualism and competition. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that would be fascinating though, like um, to apply disease modeling ideas to the microbiome, which, um, um, I'd be interested to look. I mean, it's probably being done, but uh, so uh, in short, I, I can't really answer that question, I'm afraid, because mm -hmm. I don't work in that okay. area. Okay, so I hope Spiridion, um, <laughs> yeah, he acknowledges that um, you try to answer his question. Thanks a lot. So uh, Paolo Lisboa, you, you have changed, uh, you have uh, raised your hand as well. Yeah, um, if you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so, uh, my question is more in uh, more naive because it's not really my field, but uh, I, I went work in your networks and there is known that um, if you have um, highly connected systems, but they are asynchronous, then they can be stable. And now, so my question is this, um, in dynamical systems of the type you're describing, of course, it, it, the, the behavior depends on whether they're continuous or discrete, and if they are discrete, whether they are synchronous or asynchronous. How far do your results transfer across these different uh, regimes? Uh... <laughs> in other words, if, if you think of, of, of you know, ecological systems as Discre made study discrete, discrete systems as well, but if you think of them as asynchronous discrete systems, does that make a difference to the stability properties? Uh, 
Uh, it, it's it's a whole different. Uh, the analogies. I, I personally find it hard to make, to try and use one system to talk about the other system. So these are, you know, neural oscillators, I imagine you're talking about, which are synchronizing. Um, um, it's it's something that, that you wouldn't really apply to, uh, to population models. So, you know, it's very, I mean, um, take the uh, Kuramoto model, okay, which, you know, can have synchronous or chaotic or God knows what, uh, all sorts of asynchronous and synchronous behaviors depending on the interactions. I mean, it, you can spend your life studying that, um, but it, it may not tell you anything about uh, things we we rarely see that behavior in ecological systems. I mean, you in neural systems, um, I guess it's much more likely. I mean, it makes more sense that you would. I don't even. Um, I'm not even sure what you see in the brain in terms of synchrony, but we know things are synchronizing in the brain, and we um, and there are some systems in ecology where you see. Uh, uh, synchrony, but to to push over to that, um, one one would need to start with the set up with a system and say from the beginning, okay, let's imagine we have n species that are uh, synchronized, um, uh, which sounds a bit artificial, and and what are the conditions in which they lose synchrony or gain synchrony? And, so, sorry, and, I, I know, I, but I wasn't referring to that. I was just saying, if you take your, your differential equations, which are continuous time, yeah, turn them into difference equations oh, with, okay. with a synchrony. Yeah. Difference equations with a synchrony. With with that, with the results still translate. Difference. What's the connection with synchrony? Difference well, with that, into into difference equations, but with a stochastic, with kind of you know. Ah, yeah, they equation. will. I mean, sure, they will. Yeah, it's fine. It's, okay, that's that's what that was yeah, my yeah. question. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. So yeah, it's just um, um, the the relationship between diff, um, discrete and continuous differential yeah. equations and their stability properties. I mean, to a point, we know enough is known about the uh, the relationship between the stability properties. They're not exactly the same, but they they have. Uh, uh, they're well defined and, and known. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, are there any more questions? I don't see any more questions in the chat and um, no one in the audience is raising their hands. Um, so I would like to thank you once again, Louis, for um, giving us a talk and um, I hope you'll enjoy your evening in, in Melbourne. And yeah, um, yeah we are. <laughs> oh, thanks everyone. A Thank clap. You. Yeah, there's a few claps and um, congratulations and um, all that. So thanks a lot for your talk. Thank you everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks. <laughs>